Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today is a very special episode all about the history of New Orleans jazz. This episode was primarily recorded in July of 2019 when I was in New Orleans uh, to see the Rolling Stones, which I'll explain in a minute. These are interviews that were done in person, as opposed to what I usually do, which is via the phone or Skype, so it sounds a little different. Um, Like, you're going to hear from Stanton Moore, great New Orleans jazz drummer, um, who's in Galactic and a clinician and educator. We're also going to hear from Walter Harris. He's the drummer for the Preservation Hall Jazz Band, and he's going to teach us all about the Mardi Gras Indians and their amazing culture and heritage and their impact on New Orleans jazz. Also, we talked to Joe Lasty, who is one of the other drummers at the Preservation Hall Jazz Band and is just a legend in the New Orleans scene. You're also going to hear from Greg Lambuzi. He's the director of the New Orleans Jazz Museum, and we did a phone interview before any of this happened and I went to New Orleans, but then I had the chance to go to the museum when I was there and uh, check out the Drumsville exhibit. So you're going to hear little bits of him throughout the episode, but then at the end, I'm going to uh, include his description of what this exhibit is, because for all of us drummers, it is just amazing. So um, stick around to the end, and you'll hear a little bit more about that. Now, to explain the Rolling Stone stuff that happened, um, I'll take some time right now to tell you about it. And if you want to go ahead and skip ahead like 10 or 15 minutes, you can get right into the interview with Stanton Moore. But uh, I think this is a pretty cool story, so I'll go through it. I owe all of this, first off, to Don McCauley, who is Charlie Watts drum tech. Uh, He made this experience possible, and it was amazing. So um, what happened was... If you remember back, if you've listened to the show for a while, uh, I had Brooks Tegler on, who came on and described how Charlie Watts purchased Gene Krupa's lost drum collection that was found in a storage unit that had been locked up since 1973 when he passed away. So Charlie Watts bought it, and um, then Don and Brooks basically, I guess together, Brooks reached out to me, but they thought that coming onto the podcast would be a good way for people to hear about this collection and get the word out, um, which I'm honored that that happened. So, we did the episode, fast forward, I'm at the Chicago Drum Show uh, in 2019, and Don is there with the Gene Krupa drums. They're there, the ones we talked about, the collection um, that Charlie Watts owns, and Don is basically, you know, taking care of. So I'm talking with Don, and he basically says, uh, what about interviewing Charlie Watts? And I said holy crap, that would be unbelievable. I would love to do that. Uh, Is that even possible? And he said, yeah, there's a tour coming up. The Stones are going on the road. What about coming to, and we looked at some places that aren't too far away from me and all this stuff. uh, We ended up landing on New Orleans and it was kind of like, yeah, we'll do it. And I'm like, "Uh, okay, this is unbelievable. So I text my wife who's pregnant and we just sort of, there's not too much like locked in yet, but it's like, okay, this might happen. So, um, Fast forward, we get closer. Don says, yes, let's do it. I cannot confirm at all that you can talk to Charlie, which I'm like, that's fine. doesn't matter. Um, Just to be there and go see the Stones would be amazing. So fast forwarding a little bit. um, Well, I don't want to skip this. There was basically a hurricane uh, or supposed to be a hurricane in New Orleans that day um, of the show. So they postponed it a day. I mean, it's... I had plane tickets purchased. They were canceling things. Hotels were closing. The hurricane didn't even end up really happening, but I was about to rent a car and drive 12 hours to get there with a pregnant wife who's 35 weeks pregnant, which isn't smart, but, uh, you know, come on. It's Rolling Stones. Backing up for a second, uh, a few days earlier, I think Greg from the New Orleans Jazz Museum, I I asked him, I said, hey, I'm going to be there. Do you have Stanton Moore's number? And I have... At that point, I have zero connection to Stanton Moore. Um, I saw him at Drum Days in 2002 when I was um, 12 years old. So, uh, (laughs) like, that's my only connection to him was seeing him then. He said, yes, here's his number. I texted him. Stanton pretty much instantly responded and said, yeah, let's do it. Contact me when you're here and you can come to my house and interview me. And I was like, that's unbelievable. You're Stanton Moore. Um, So that's set up. I wanted to get the most out of being there and talking with people. So, uh, yeah. So then we get to New Orleans. It's postponed today because of the storm. But we end up there. Uh, we go to our hotel, which is basically connected to the Mercedes-Benz Superdome, which is where they're playing. Um, we check in. Don says, hey, let's meet up and go to the um, Preservation Jazz Hall, which I had no idea what that was at that point. We go there. It's this just amazing jazz hall, tons of history. 
We see people performing, um, which would be Joe Lasty, who I mentioned before, and you'll hear from in this episode. Um, I meet all these people, sit there, Abby, my wife, Don and I are watching the show. It's great. Then Don says, hey, well, you want to go in the back and actually do some interviews and talk with people? And I'm like, oh my God, yes, that'd be awesome. Um, so Abby peels off. She's like, no, I'm pregnant. I'm going to go back to the hotel and lay down. Um, so anyway, we're back there. You're going to hear in this, it's, this isn't like we're set up in a quiet room. There's some chatter and stuff, which is, it is what it is. We were there just doing it on the fly. So I talk with Walter Harris, the drummer. I talk with Joe Lasty. We have fun. We're hanging out, um, get the interviews. Everything's great. And then Don says, uh, and I'm just going to tell you the whole story here. Don says, do you want to come to dinner with the Rolling Stones crew? Basically the techs and the stage crew and all that stuff. And I'm like, (laughs) if if you want me, I will come. Uh, I don't want to like step on your toes. So anyway, we go, we hang out at this really cool restaurant, we walk in, but the cool thing is, is we walk in and then Ronnie Wood from the Rolling Stones is at the table next to us, which I'm just like, this is insane. I'm losing my mind. Um, But we have dinner. It's awesome. Everyone was great. And also I need to mention that uh, at dinner, Don said, hey, why don't you invite Stanton Moore to come to the Rolling Stones show? Um, And have this experience and and like go backstage and and all that good stuff. So, uh, I was like, it's just insane for me who, uh, is a relative nobody, um, compared to Stanton Moore and Charlie Watts to be able to do that and extend that invite via Don. So that was really cool. He gave me that opportunity, um, which uh, I texted Stanton and Stanton was like, uh, yeah, I think I can make that work. Um, so he and his wife got to come with us, but we'll explain that more in a little bit. We then, I think, have a beer, and then I'm like, all right, I'm going to leave you guys alone. I don't want to be like a third wheel, so I peel off. The next day, I go to the New Orleans Jazz Museum, and I meet with Greg, who you're hearing in this episode, um, and he shows me around the Drumsville exhibit and the back room where they keep all their records, and it's just really cool, great people. Everyone in New Orleans was awesome, Um, so we do that. It's awesome. You'll hear more about the actual exhibit at the end of the episode, like I said. But um, so then it's time to go to the concert. So I go back to the hotel, get my stuff together Um, at all times throughout this entire weekend. In my back pocket, I had these two little um, Tascam recorders that are like lavalier mics that um, they have little SD cards in them. So they record straight to themselves. So there's no extra crazy stuff because I wanted to be able to record and interview Charlie or any of these people at any point in time. Um, and spoiler alert, I didn't get to interview Charlie. I'll explain that later, but I don't want you to think there's some surprise at the end of this where, where like then Charlie Watts comes in. You would know the episode would be called my interview with Charlie Watts, but, um, it was still amazing. So, uh, anyway, we end up going to the concert. We go around the back of the Superdome and I meet with Don who's got wristbands for us. And we got these VIP passes at, uh, this hotel. And that was a whole different thing of just getting them and going into this room where they're like, you know, there's pastries and tennis on TV and Rolling Stones tickets and a stack, uh, which was cool. But anyway, we are at the back of the Superdome. We're meeting Don, um, Stanton rolls in and, uh, then we are entering the back of the Superdome, go through the metal detector and then boom, we're like on stage. You basically come in, you walk like 20 feet and then you're on stage. So, there's Charlie's drums, there's everyone's gear, there's like road cases that they said are just completely full of guitars, like 50 guitars in each road case. It was just nuts. So then uh, Don is like, do you guys want to come up and see Charlie's drums? So Stanton and I get to go up and they're covered with a curtain. So he lifts the curtain up and there they are. There's his Gretsch kit with, I believe, a DW snare with the lips on it. And the UFIP symbols and a Speed King pedal and Keith Moon stick bag. And it's just like an old school throne, which is just kind of like indented, you know, like the old leather ones where you can tell someone sat on it for 50 years. Um, So he's like, why don't you guys get some pictures there? And just it was unreal. So we're hanging out on stage and just being there as long as humanly possible and touching his drums and stuff. And then Don says, do you want to meet Charlie? Of course. I was like, yes, let's go do it. Um, So then Abby, my wife, is like, all right, I'll stay here. And again, she's super pregnant. And Don is like, no, you're coming with. Um, The key thing I learned is that 
everyone loves a pregnant lady. It just makes everyone happy. Um, and they kind of like took care of her and were like, you can sit here. And uh, Don the whole time was just like, do you want to sit down? Do you want to sit? Can I help you? Can I get you a water? It was awesome. Very, very, very nice. So then we get basically taken around the back of the Superdome. There's a room that almost has like road signs that are um, like named where for each person's uh, dressing room. So uh, I remember Charlie's was the Cotton Club, which is a classic jazz club. Uh, Keith Richards was Camp X-Ray. So Don takes Stanton back first to meet Charlie, because Charlie knows who Stanton is because they were just at the Jazz Museum, and there's a video that features Stanton, and he probably just knows of him as a drummer, but uh, Don knew that that's, he had just seen his stuff and was given a pair of Stanton Moore sticks. So, um, yeah. So they go back. I'm hanging out. I'm talking with this lady at the door, and we're talking, and we're talking, and then the door opens, and then Mick Jagger walks out, and it was just like, he just had this like aura about him. Uh, he's Mick Jagger. He just kind of walks right by us and then he gets on a golf cart and just buzzes away in the Superdome, which was like pretty surreal. Then the door closes and, and I can see like Keith Richards in there and I'm like peeking my head as it closes. <laughs> like, hello, can I come in? Um, so they're meeting and hanging out and then Don comes out and says, all right, why don't you guys come back and meet Charlie? So we come through the door, down the hall, take a right into a dressing room and it is just like nothing I expected. It is, there's candles, there's big comfy chairs and couches. Charlie's standing there ready to greet us. He's got jazz books about New Orleans on the table. He's got a, um, like a towel over the table that says the cotton club, which I believe I'm kind of assuming, but I I would assume that, um, each dressing room is set up with historical jazz stuff for the city that he's in. So if he's in Chicago, it would be Chicago jazz books. If he's in New York, it would be New York jazz books. That's just kind of what I'm gathering. We talk with him. He is just a great guy. We talk about Brooks Tegler, who is the one who verified that the the reason all this happened, that that Gene Krupa drum set and gear is actually real. We talked about his collection. He's got He's got a massive collection, like warehouse full of like Sonny Payne's drums from the Smithsonian in crates. I think I heard he has like Napoleon sword. He's got everything. So we're talking, we're hanging out. Uh, It was probably like 15 minutes in total. There was absolutely no, it would have been weird if I said, let's do the interview. Can I put a microphone on you? It didn't, it was, it was, it didn't happen and it was perfectly fine that way. Um, I talked to him about drum history, which was awesome. Give him a card, do all this. We get pictures. Stanton gets pictures. They're talking about stuff. Um, And then we're walking out the door saying, great, thank you. Um, Again, Abby, my wife, pregnant. He offers her a seat. She's sitting there. It's just really nice. Very nice person. We're walking out the door. And then Charlie says to who I don't know it is. He says, Don, aren't you going to introduce my friends to the rest of the band? So we're in the hall, and there's Ron Wood and Bernard Fowler, who is the longtime backup singer for the Stones. So I'm just like, hey, it's nice to meet you guys. We were just talking about uh, this, and I kind of I gave um, Bernard a drum history card. And then Ron Wood was like, well, I like drums too. Can I have one? <laughs> I was just like, this is insane. So then Ronnie Wood got a card, and we talked about some stuff, and then we get uh, taken out, and we go back up top, and... Um, Go up to the VIP area, which again was just amazing. Um, free beer, king size candy bars, uh, which I'm really cheap, so that was my takeaway: is I can take some candy bars for like the airplane. But um, then we go and we hang out. The show starts. Don hooked it up, so we were up in the pit, right in the front, on Keith Richards' side. So we're off to the side there. Just enjoying the show. The Stones were unbelievable. Um, they played great. There was a barrier that had seats, so Abby could actually sit down for a lot of it because your feet start to hurt when you're that pregnant. Um, it was great. Stones killed it. We wrapped up, end of the show, um, went back to the hotel, and then we were gone the next day. And now, because we had the baby, six months later ish, I'm releasing this episode uh, on Mardi Gras. So that's pretty much it. It was a unbelievable experience that I owe completely 
to Don McCauley with a huge thank you to Brooks Tegler for getting me in touch. Um, and it just goes to show that you never know who's going to check out what you're doing and what, what crazy things might happen. Like I never thought I'd be hanging out with Stanton Moore. Um, so on that note, let's start the episode and jump in to my conversation with the great Stanton Moore at his practice space. Bear with me on the sound quality because I had not really used these recorders that much, so it gets a little funky at times, but, uh, but yeah, enjoy the episode. Just about everything can be traced back to some roots that come from New Orleans. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that I say a lot is, you know, whether you like funk or country or western <laughs> yep or polka or norwegian death metal <laughs> yeah all of those things have a backbeat even if norwegian death metal the backbeat is super fast yeah it still is coming from a backbeat and that backbeat can be traced back to having roots in new orleans and what i love to do is you know what what we'll call musical archaeology, where you start digging deeper and trying to figure out well, where did this come from? And so for me, tracing the backbeat back, you know, I really personally feel like it's got roots in some of the the marches, mm -hmm. the European marches, the Civil War marches. Yeah. With the with the five stroke roll, you start buzzing that, zap, 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 bap, bap, and if you're playing the buzz with just the left hand and you're tapping quarter notes with the right, that 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 zap, buzz, buzz, yeah, buzz, zap, buzz, buzz, zap, buzz, zap, buzz, zap. Well, that buzz. Bzap, 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 bzap. Tagadoon, gagadoon, gagadoon, gagadoon. Josephine, tagadoon, gagadoon. Where do you do? Sackadoon, backadoon, gagadoon. Tatadoon, 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 You start straightening it out, and you know Ringo Starr and Charlie Watts mm -hmm. started straightening things out that they were hearing played by Earl Palmer, mm -hmm. and Earl Palmer was taking things that he was hearing played in a jazz context and then started slamming that backbeat mm -hmm. throughout the whole tune whereas that backbeat might have only been played for the shout choruses and yep. the endings of tunes and then you've got earl palmer playing that backbeat throughout the whole tune and then you get guys like like ringo and charlie straightening that out i mean that's the whole basis of rock and roll you know keep in mind when you've got Chuck Berry and even some of the early Elvis stuff and, you know, but Chuck Berry, Little Richard, you know, Fats Domino, all that stuff was still based in a swing pulse. And then uh, with Elvis stuff was still swung with the early, the early uh, Elvis stuff and things start to really straighten out when you get to the Beatles and, yeah. and, uh, and and the stones and things like that and those guys start straightening these things out and that's when rock and roll really starts to sound more like what we have today i mean you yeah. still have guys like lenny kravitz and the roots replicating things that the stones and the beatles were doing in the 60s yep. you know Absolutely. and then before that stuff stuff was based in a swing pulse yeah. so once those guys started straightening things out then you really have what a lot of rock and roll sounds like today, yeah. still to this day. So backing up, it all started here, basically. That kind of swing, that kind of, it, it all evolved. And it wasn't overnight, right? obviously. Right, and you know, some people will make an argument that some of it started uh, in Mississippi mm -hmm. and, in, you know, in, in parts of, of other parts of the Mississippi Delta. Sure. And, and that is true. Um, you know, I mean, like you said, it didn't happen overnight and it didn't happen all in one house. Yeah, or one, one building show, or, one night. Yeah, but you know, most history all uh, points as New Orleans uh, being, you know, one of the most integral parts of it. I mean, I, I'm like, you know, nobody can claim full credit. I mean, keep in mind, cats were 
up and down the river. I mean, I will say this. It, I believe that, you know, predominantly Western music comes from the Mississippi River. Sure. You know, and of course you've got Memphis and, and uh, Clarksdale, yeah. you know, all these other uh, places um, that things did develop too. Yeah, but, sure. You know, it, it's all coming together down here in the South, up and down the Mississippi River, you know? So. And now, so New Orleans, though, was like such a hub of people wanted to come here because it's a cool happening city, right? So then they would bring their styles together and they would blend when they're playing together. Oh, yeah, one million percent. And I mean, you know, as we talk about musical and also historical archaeology, you know, a friend of mine, Ned Sublette, wrote this book called The World That Made New Orleans. And it's a very in-depth, detailed account of what makes New Orleans the melting pot that it is. Yeah. So some of the ordinances that got passed, some of the uh, historical events that happened that made it so, well, this is why this happened this way. This is why you have French people um, moving here during that time and then them, uh, you know, mingling with African people. And these are the different cultures and these are the different customs that actually did merge to create this thing that we all know as this now. You know, this is why this street is named this street. This is why this parish is named this parish. Yeah. This is, you know, uh, uptown New Orleans was a town called Lafayette. And that's why you've got Bourbon Street, you know, Royal Street becomes St. Charles when you get across Canal Street. Mm. There were two different towns. Uptown was, was Lafayette, a different Lafayette than the, the Lafayette that we know that's two and a half sure. hours away. Yeah. But it was a different town. And then they both grew into each other. Didn't know and that. that's wow. why you've got, you know, streets that have different names up until Canal Street. And so that book, anybody who's interested in any of this, you know, especially you, you seem very interested in this stuff. Yep. Um, it was very interesting to me to read all of this and and learn some of the historical, you know, actualities that contributed to to what happened in music. Yeah. And and culture. The convergences of European and African culture, we all know that that created this musical melting pot that made the music of New Orleans, you know, it's been said a million times, it's almost cliche now, but this musical gumbo, <laughs> yep. you know, um, you know, with Galactic, we have a rule that we, we won't, we won't say that in, <laughs> in any uh, interviews, you know, and it is a fitting term, but it's now become slightly overused, but that book in particular that I just talked about, Ned Sublette, um, The World That Made New Orleans. Got it. The wor meaning that it's just this people all over the world. And maybe, because I mean, there's people, some people from around the world who might be listening to this who just don't know exactly what we're talking about. So can you explain a little bit about how the French, how that kind of happened? I mean, we don't need the whole world history, but so they, right. yeah. What was Well, that? New Orleans was not just an integral port city in the United States, but New Orleans was an integral port city for the world, the Caribbean, the uh, Europe. So, you know, the first time I went to Sevilla, Spain, you know, the river there, a lot of goods are coming from Europe, coming through the river there and then coming through the port of Sevilla. Well, then once it leaves the port of Sevilla, which is a port that's servicing much of Europe, guess where it goes? It comes across the ocean to Cuba and then into New Orleans. Mm. So you've got a direct line between Sevilla and New Orleans is the, are the two ports that connect Europe got to the United States. Yeah. So then you've got all this European uh, culture and goods and people coming over and they're coming straight from Europe to New Orleans, sometimes passing through Cuba a lot. Yeah, and getting that culture. And getting that culture and then coming uh, to New Orleans and then through the horrible practices of slavery, you've got all this forced migration 
of African people coming over from different parts of Africa, a lot of West Africa, and coming over and then coming to where? New Orleans, mm-hmm. you know? Coming to some of the, the other um, ports along the, the eastern seaboard too, but a lot of this is coming from Africa to New Orleans, mm-hmm. sometimes passing through Cuba too, but this is all African culture winding up eventually in New Orleans, European culture winding up in New Orleans, and that's, you know, French, Spanish, all these different European cultures, yeah. and they're winding up in New Orleans, and they're mingling with African culture because New Orleans was the only place to allow African slaves to practice their culture really their religion dance and song their culture was allowed to be practiced in congo square on sundays up until about the time of the civil war and this was practiced in congo square and on sundays much to the chagrin of the catholics but the thinking while New Orleans was under Spanish rule. Spanish uh, governing forces felt that it would promote harmony within the ranks of the slaves if they were allowed to practice their own culture that they were accustomed to from Africa. Got it. So they said, well, why don't we let them practice their, their culture and have a market where they could sell things that they have been working on and making in their free time while on the different plantations. Sure. So these these African people were allowed to come into Congo Square, bring their goods, sell their goods, dance, play music, and, 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 uh, and sing and practice their religion, which a lot of times their religion, they would have to also mask that religion and they would take some of their deities and give them Catholic saint names. And that became some of the Santeria, and it also became some of the, the voodoo that that we see. And, you know, this is all Cliff Notes sure. versions. Obviously, right? you can go a lot of deeper. Yeah, and I don't, yeah. I don't really consider myself a historian on this stuff. I've read... Um, you know, stuff to educate myself on this. Yeah, but, no, this but, you is know, great. Guy, guys like Ned Sublette can, like, sit here and, and rattle off ordinances that happened, you know, that led to this and that. And 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 Ned is, is just so brilliant in both his writings and in person, yeah. you know. But um, so anybody who is interested in these things, I would, I would suggest further reading with some of Ned's books. And then, you know, there's tons of other stuff I'm sure that, I'll create a list that we can yeah, yeah, reference yeah. that we can put in links and people can the, check the out podcast that people can check out for further reading. Yeah. If you're interested in, the, in these things, but um, you know, you in general, you had all this convergence of European and African culture. And, and it wasn't just, you know, African um, general. I mean, it was very specific from, you know, uh, different parts of Angola and 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 the Congo and western parts mm-hmm. of uh, of Africa and certain certain customs, certain rhythms, certain specific things from certain specific areas turned into certain specific things uh, in New Orleans. You know, yes. and, and that's you know all the things that that made New Orleans so so unique. Yeah, and made it so special. To this day, I mean, it was mm-hmm. the only place in the United States that allowed African people to practice their culture. So you've got in New Orleans, you've got African culture being kept alive and being allowed to uh, to kind of integrate with European culture. Yeah. And these things start creating, I mean, you take European marches, mm-hmm. right, which are very straight up and down. And then you start having African rhythms start to kind of um, mix with some of this stuff. And you get, you know, from... Well, then you start getting a 2-3 clave that's coming with roots from Africa developing in Cuba. So a 2-3 clave being... Yep. 
fucked up. And New Orleans, as we all know, we're below sea level. So things start to round out a little bit because mm-hmm. things are hot, muggy. <laughs> yes. And, uh, and you know, you just kind of, you know, things start to become a little bit more relaxed. Here. Yeah, kind of wavy, you know? Yeah, so the, the rhythm that, that is mm, ka, 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 ka in New Orleans starts to become mm, ka, 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 ka. Yep. It becomes rounded out. So you get boom. You get that mixing with European instruments, which let's keep in mind, trumpets, trombones, mm-hmm. clarinets, saxophones. The brass band. Yeah. Bass drum, snare drum. Those are all European instruments. Yeah. But then you start getting some of the the african rhythms that start to start to migrate um and influence you know start to blend with and influence some of the european rhythms Mm -hmm. well then that's when you start to get the birth of you know this whole second line tradition which of course second line is coming from the the funeral processions and the notion that the, you know, you talk to different people and you hear different accounts, but the basically the hearse and the family are the first line, and then the band and the the people celebrating the life of that person. Yeah, uh, that's the second line. Got it. And that of seems the funeral procession, like the afterlife, and it, with the culture here, I'm sure that's extremely important. And the music was a big part of that. Right. One obviously. million percent. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so in New Orleans, we celebrate someone's passing in we celebrate their life and we celebrate hopefully the notion that they're going up to a better place. And you know, this is also coming from a very African tradition. I mean, sure. Um, you know, the whole funeral procession and funeral uh celebration is has roots in 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 African history and culture mm-hmm. as well so you know here in new orleans that's what you have going on is people parading in the streets playing european instruments and the rhythms are influenced by african rhythms and then but you're still playing on european instruments but then you also start getting gospel hymns mm-hmm. and melodies that are coming out of some of the gospel churches yeah. right so you get those songs being you know gospel songs and hymns being played on european instruments with with african rhythms yeah and that's what kids are growing up younger people are growing up hearing that so it's in their psyche to have those rhythms and stuff so then it becomes a part of who you are yeah right i mean you grow up around it and you you don't even know that you know you go to other places you know, I talk about this with people all the time. Like, you know, you grow up in New Orleans, you start traveling the world, you're like, wait a minute, that's a that's not a graveyard. Where are all the the graves? Yeah, you know, it, yeah. And like, oh no, they everywhere else in the world, they actually put people in the ground. Here in New Orleans, <laughs> yeah, you got to put everybody above ground. Yeah, you start realizing how different New Orleans is, and you're like. Wait, this isn't a funeral. Where's the where's the where's the band? Yeah. You know? It's not a party, but it is. It's a celebration, it's a celebration. of life. Yeah. And yeah. And uh and it and and it is respectful and and it is meant to honor that person and their life. And you know, you don't want to say it's a party and make it sound like no. they're celebrating the fact that the person is gone. They're celebrating their life and they're celebrating the notion that the person is going on to a better place. And that culturally is where a lot of people would hear music because in this, what 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 time frame are we looking at right now with this? Like, are we talking early 1900s, 1800s, you think? Oh, definitely. I mean, uh, that's a good question. When did it start? By the, um, the late 1800s, definitely it was a, a practice that was, was, you know, very common. Uh, and you had the social aid and pleasure clubs that would, um, you know, back then they weren't social aid and pleasure clubs yet. They were benevolent societies. So, you know, a lot of African, uh, people of African descent couldn't get 
life insurance couldn't afford a funeral at the end mm. of their life. So they would pay into these benevolent societies. And then at the uh, end of their life, the benevolent society would hire the band and would help with the funeral costs. And then that eventually developed into social aid and pleasure clubs. And that's why you've got, you know, during the year on Sundays, you've got second lines that happen and each social aid and pleasure club, they'll throw a second line to celebrate their organization. And it's not necessarily because somebody passed, they just have a second line. So you'll have, you know, all these different uh, social aid and pleasure clubs doing, their, you know, second yeah. lines on Sundays. Yeah. What is a social aid and pleasure club? Like, what does that mean? It's coming from, you know, the benevolent societies, which started off as a formal uh, kind of a community service that you would buy into that would, if you needed help, say your house flooded and Got it. you needed help. It's like insurance. Or your like house, yeah. yeah. But, but as an African American back then, you couldn't get life insurance. You couldn't get insurance. So they would create these benevolent societies for themselves so that if, if you needed help, so you would pay your dues and then you would pay into this society and then and then if when you when it came time for your funeral they would help cover those costs if you needed help your house burned down or you fell on hard times or your house flooded they would help with things like that and then eventually became social aid and pleasure clubs so and you pay dues into the social aid and pleasure club and then as part of a member every at least once a year, they throw a second line. They throw a party in the street and they hire bands. Cool. And then along the route, people grill and uh, people, you know, are hanging and uh, and dancing in the streets. And they parade from one place to another. And along the route, you'll have people stationed, you know, cooking, cooking up all kinds of different great yeah. stuff to eat. And, uh, it's a and good it's a, time. And it's a great time. It's, yeah. a, it's a party in the street. You know? huh. That's awesome. My question then is, at this time, we got the European instruments, we've got the bass drum, we've got the snare. They're not together yet. The formal drum set hasn't been put together where someone's, some, they're playing separate things. Correct. We've got a kick drum, we get, it's, and double drumming hasn't existed yet, where double drumming refers to, as you know, bass drum and snare together. And I've heard that it, it, pop, it started really early on, I'm sure there's other places, but in New Orleans, where the guy gets the marching bass drum, maybe he doesn't even have a pedal for it yet because it hasn't been invented. Correct. He takes a snare drum, puts it on a chair. Mm -hmm. Right? So yeah. things are changing. Early 1900s. Now let's jump over to Greg Lambuzi of the New Orleans Jazz Museum. For no other reason, um, think of uh, the economy of having uh, one person playing these drums versus a bass drum player. Uh, yeah. You know, somebody playing the cymbals, the snare, et cetera. So uh, D.D. Chandler is credited with uh, being the first in New Orleans to adapt a drum pedal to his uh, to his bass drum and mm -hmm. add other drums around it, the snare, et cetera. Uh, and this this bass this uh, uh, bass drum pedal was mounted from the top. And uh, yeah, like the uh, those are like the the overhang kind of pedal, right? Which was like a real that's right. yeah. Kind of a unique, it's interesting to see stuff like that and then where you end up and you think, oh, duh, why don't you just put it on the ground? But you don't, you take that for granted, knowing that how a bass drum pedal would work or even having a pedal to begin with and putting the, the because the bass drum, it didn't have feet on it. It was just sitting there. It was an old marching bass drum. That's right. That's right. In the, um, and you must have, it must have been, you know, a certain finesse to play it, you know, just like any uh, bass drum pedal, um, you know, think of like if you have an old one that you played with. Um, you might have to finesse it in a certain way. I'm sure these these overhangs, it, it took a little while to get used to uh, getting some good sounds out of it, but I'm sure it was definitely possible. Can you explain a little bit? I, we haven't really talked about that particular pedal on the um, uh, on the show. Now, do you know more details about it? Yeah, so the, well, we have one in the, um, in the exhibit. It was the one um, that uh, Papa Jack Lane, who was a... Um, uh, he... he, he uh, had a number of brass bands going at once in the 1880s, all the way up to the 20s. Um, but he created his own pedal uh, and, you know, his own kit too. But um, this one, so it clamps to one side of the drum, basically the, the front, the front uh, rim, if I remember right, of the, uh, I mean, of the, of the front drum head comes sure. back 
and then there's a and it clamps onto the back um, rim, and then there's a spring mechanism, a spring, and then it connects to another mechanism, goes over to the batter head side, and then this the pedal kind of hangs, and it's um, then there's another piece that sits on the floor, so the pedal is a, you know is pulling back on the uh, on that on that uh, on that spring. 1909 is the year that Ludwig manufactured and mass produced a bass drum pedal that was actually a workable pedal that they actually marketed. Yeah. And that is really when the drum set started to take off. When people started buying that pedal and putting it on the drums and then, you know, adding Chinese tom toms exactly. and adding Chinese symbols and all these things. Temple but, blocks. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Most historians are on the same page that Didi Channel was the first guy to start applying a pedal to the bass drum and playing the bass drum and snare drum as, yeah. a, as a set. It's a drum in set. In New Orleans, yeah. Cool, cool. Okay, that's awesome. And then from there, it just sort of blows up. And this is, it's cool that like, these were marching bass drums. There's no, there's no feet on them. They're just, you're just Correct. setting it up. Correct, yeah. And then people started making um, clip-on spurs mm -hmm. to keep the bass drum from sliding yep. and moving forward. And I've heard Leedy invented the snare stand. I think that's probably debatable too, but they mass produced the snare stand, which it's just out of necessity. Yeah, and that that was really part of what helped move the drum set along too. Mm -hmm. Coming up with a snare stand that was short enough that you could sit down and mm -hmm. play. Yeah. Right? Because, I mean, I would imagine there were snare stands for classical snare drum in orchestras. I didn't think about that. But to come up with a snare stand that was that went low enough to sit down a drum set, and play. Yeah, yeah. So you get that short snare drum stand and the bass drum pedal together, and then you really start to, you know, have what becomes the beginning of the drum set. Yeah, exactly, which in New Orleans. And one thing I've seen with watching the guys at Preservation Hall yesterday is that there's this kind of like, you have a hi-hat, a ride and but early on they'd obviously have they wouldn't have rides they'd have like the little china and stuff but it's this kind of accents and little like t -t 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 and wood blocks wood blocks and ratchets yep and yep. cowbells yep yeah um it's you know, a lot of fun oh yeah you know yeah of course i mean yeah playing the drums is like the greatest thing ever <laughs> <laughs> agreed yeah cool so um, so then going through the 1900s, just in the history of New Orleans drumming, I mean, so it just keeps evolving then, basically. And we go through, there's the Mardi Gras Indians that are a part of the history of all yeah. this. Yeah. Now let's learn more about the Mardi Gras Indians from Walter Harris at Preservation Jazz Hall. Yeah, the Mardi Gras Indian culture basically is a culture of African Americans that preserve a tradition that they had gathered from their ancestors that were runaway slaves mm. that ran and migrated with natives. Native Americans. Na Native Americans. Yeah. They migrated with Native, and all of them was kind of in the same boat of kind of trying to dodge the, the, the Europeans. You know, they was, in, they was pretty much kind of dodging the Europeans. So mm. they kind of banded together and he learned a lot of the culture and tradition of the natives. So a lot of these African-Americans migrated to New Orleans. And I'm sure that it was the Homa Indians that they um, had learned a lot of these traditions and cultures from. This is yeah. what I'm gathering, because that's like the closest tribe we have here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, coming through, it would have been a Seminoles coming through Florida. Mm -hmm. But um, learning these traditions and cultures from these natives, they um, learned how to beat, how to sequence, and how to build this India regalia. Yeah. And they also did a lot of celebrating, a lot of dancing, a lot of drumming, and a lot of dancing to um, to play trip, trip, um, homage to the natives. Once the African, once the Africans got a hold to it, it became something else. Yeah. And they migrated their bamboola to it. So it became more of a, a 
the approach of David Garibaldi, where he's taking these stickings and he's adding uh, texture to these stickings by, you know, adding in Swiss triplets and all. I mean, it's a it's a concept that I talk about all the time. Poor David Garibaldi is probably sick of hearing me talk about, <laughs> you know, Garibaldizing uh, stuff. But that's what I talk about. It's like, okay, here you got this sticking. That's cool. But now let's add texture to it. And then when you start splitting up that textured sticking, and it's textured now because you've added flams and, and mm -hmm. Swiss triplets to it, and then I start splitting it up to instruments that I've, you know, borrowed from Mardi Gras Indian music and, and culture. So, you know, that's why I have, like I said, that's why we have the Pondero tuned low, mic'd from underneath, so it'll sound like a mix between a tambourine and a bass drum. Yeah. And then I split that stuff up between that and a cowbell and different other things and sure. sometimes really weird sounding Pete Englehart percussion or whatever other things I feel like trying to incorporate. And then I'm using those stickings and those texturized variations of those stickings, splitting them up between Mardi Gras Indian um, sounds, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and, and then coming up with with you know all kinds of stuff based off that and i mean i've i've you know done that uh all throughout my my career and i continue to do it and the more i do it the more i fall in love with it and the more i learn about it and the more i come up with new ideas i'm like oh this is really good and this is <laughs> yeah. you know and i'm coming up with these ideas and it's all based out of mixing the mardi gras indian stuff with linear and layered and textured contemporary drum concepts yeah that i've learned from steve gadd david garibaldi and you know countless other incredible drummers and then i'm just try taking their concepts and trying to apply mardi gras indian stuff to it <laughs> man it's just it's the gumbo <laughs> yeah you know but yeah but you know and i love doing that i'm just trying to contemporize and modernize the the new orleans stuff Absolutely. the brass band stuff and especially the mardi gras indian stuff so, and then just to take it on home with this, so the New Orleans drumming style just evolved over time, basically with the jazz. It's its own sound still. You can still hear New Orleans style, but it's still evolving, I'm sure, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's just never ending. But you hear these guys, and I talked with uh, Joe Lasty last night about it, about how it's not, it's fun and it's not like, like showy where like a, an arena rock drummer spinning a stick like that. It's more of like, you're, you're, you're theatrical with your playing. Now we're going back to Preservation Jazz Hall to talk with Joe Lasty, who I had just seen perform a few minutes earlier, and uh, you'll hear Don McCauley chiming in a few times um, off mic as well. Well, really, I grew up playing half-ass and the other ass way. When I developed this way, that's when I started playing on Bourbon Street. Okay. Yeah, as soon as I started playing on Bourbon Street, that's when I started developing my stuff, self to go the other way. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's almost, you've got a kind of a loose, and I should, I should ask you, because I haven't seen a ton of music around here yet, is your style of playing, obviously it's your own way of it's playing. It's my own way. But is it, is, it, is it, are people having a similar style and just the, the kind of, how would you define New Orleans drumming? Well, you know, like I told you, it's, it's definitely out of the church. Okay. And like I told you, it's the, that gumbo, the gumbo starts with a root. And the root is where? It's the drums. The drums and the, got to do that bass. Mm -hmm. But yep. the, the, what separates New Orleans music, I, I say this and I keep telling people this, is it's the church. It's, it's that church feel. And you know what else, dude? Mm. What's been, what I've been hipping on to? Indian beat. Like Mardi Gras Indian. Yeah. I was talking just about, talking to Walter. Yeah, the yeah. Indian beat too. Yep. Yep. I've heard the bass drum and just that the, the lowest drum referred to as like mm -hmm. the mother drum. That's right. From like those cultures where it's dun, 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 mm -hmm. and it's the pulse and it's yeah. the heartbeat. Yeah. So you put the Indian pulse and the church pulse. Oh. Yeah, you get the. That's New Orleans. That's New Orleans. <laughs> so we're sitting there and you guys just walk in. 
and you've just got your bag and you guys as don put it you're walking into work right it was just awesome you kind of you don't get there two hours before and set up your drum set right i mean it's already nah, set up it's all, it's you just spun set. the floor time around and move the snare and then you're coming to work you're coming to yeah, work yeah yeah it was yeah. awesome and then you guys are just like i mean it's a, it's a shift you, you know, know it, in a good way right and it's another thing too everybody like their own symbols everybody like the way they own Dude, I could go sit on anybody drum set, any cymbals, anything, and I'm going to be me. I'm going to bring me out of those drums that I'm sitting on. Yeah. I don't care who drums it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, all cymbals, you know, because a lot of people say, well, why are you using that cymbal? Why every time you go somewhere you don't change the cymbal? I say, because I don't <laughs> let the cymbal sound like it. I make the cymbal yeah. sound like I want it to sound. You're the one playing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's awesome. You can make a cheap drum set sound great. Exactly. You can make a nice so drum I, set. I, I yeah. to, I've been told that so many times. You say, wait, hold on. We didn't think we could get a sound out of those drums. Man. I bought that for my kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But also, you know, like when you watch Shannon Powell, I mean, Shannon Powell will put on a show for you while mm -hmm. you're sitting there watching him, showing you how soft and amazingly beautifully smooth he can play a buzz roll and make everybody in the room want to get up and dance at a whisper and he, he he's like he's like and he's looking at you and winking at you <laughs> and being like check out how bad this shit is yeah check this out exactly okay yeah Ooh. He's like, uh huh, that's bad, right? Yeah. And he's looking barely right moving, at you, you know? Barely moving, barely touching the drums, and everybody in the, in the room is either out of their seat, on the edge of their seat, and it's, he's not trying to be showy. He, he is trying to impress you, but he's impressing you with his absolute control yeah. and finesse and musicality. Yeah. And he's looking at you like, yeah, check out how bad this shit is right here. Oh, go And you say, oh, that's so <laughs> deep. It's so killing. Man. And you're looking at him, you're like, yeah, that's bad. You're like the baddest dude in the world. Yeah. And he doesn't have to pick up his sticks more than six inches off the head, mm -hmm. ever. Ever. And you're like, that's oh loud. my God, you're the baddest thing I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. Man. <laughs> So you're obviously representing New Orleans drumming around the world, and you're a great ambassador for it. Um, where can people find you? Where can they hear you? All yeah. that good stuff. Well, they can find me at stantmore.com. Um, but really, the thing that I'm most excited about is my drum academy, stantmoredrumacademy.com. I'm filming, and we're in my studio right now. I'm filming video lessons in here all the time and i'm putting those up on my academy it's a subscription based site and then there's a forum where guys are interacting with me all the time asking me questions i'm making videos based off their questions and i'm writing out all these worksheets that go with the videos there's over 300 pages of written worksheets there's over 20 hours of videos um, i'm also starting to do interviews i just did an interview with adam deitch i did an interview with keith carlock sitting in these same seats that we're sitting in right now and um i'm just putting up content all the time so if anybody's interested in what i have to say on the drumming side of things i would love to have y'all come check out stantmoredrumacademy.com of course i'm on instagram and and uh, yep. facebook but also i've been putting up a lot of content on youtube some of it is abbreviated lessons, and then some of it is uh, stuff like Jazz Fest recap and, yeah. and um, a Mardi Gras recap I just did, and then when I was playing with the Mardi Gras Indians. And then uh, I'm about to, we just filmed, and we're about to edit a Red Rocks cool. recap. So even if you're not necessarily a drummer, but you're a fan of music and a fan of what I'm doing, the YouTube channel has stuff that's not just drumming based. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, you know, music based stuff too. So, all of those channels. Yep. And on the road with Galactic. On and... the road with Galactic. I play yeah. every Tuesday at Snug Harbor um, with my piano trio, David Torkinowski, James Singleton. 
my band members in Galactic and I, we just purchased Tipitina's. So, you know, if you love New Orleans music, come come to the House of Funk. Yeah. You know, Preservation Hall is, you know, the house of, of jazz preservation. We are the House of Funk Preservation. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, yeah. So, cool. Tipitina's, uh, come check us out. And um, yeah, that's those awesome. Are, those are all the things I'm involved in. Cool. Well, yeah, man. I appreciate you being on the show today. Thank and, you, Bart. With me, yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Thanks for thinking of me. And uh, yeah, thank you all for checking it out. All right, guys. I hope you've enjoyed this New Orleans special episode. Um, we're now going to close it out with our friend Greg Lambuzi from the New Orleans Jazz Museum, who's going to describe some of his uh, favorite pieces from the. Drumsville Evolution of the New Orleans Beat Exhibit. Yeah, so there's a really cool, one of the, my favorites is uh, Baby Doug's um, Ludwig Kit. It's the um, white um, oyster pearl uh, uh, set that he had. And um, curious stories. So, anyway, so we, you know, I've been with the museum for just close to 26 years now. And, um, wow. And I, uh, when I started off, I was doing inventory of the collection. And I came across a uh, little scrap of paper that said, uh, Baby Dodds' nephew. And it had his uh, Chicago phone number on it. So I said, let me, let me give him a call. <laughs> and uh, I called him and said, you, you don't have to have anything from your uncle, do you? And he said, oh, yeah, I've got the, um, the lovely kit in my closet. I'll, uh, I'll mail it to you. And uh, a couple of weeks later, we had the, uh, yeah, this beautiful kit. And uh, it's the one that he, is, he, he did all the films and, uh, and instructional, um, instructional films, et cetera, on. Wow! So it's a pretty, pretty incredible kit with still with the leather heads and um, man, all that stuff. So. That's awesome. Now, why don't we go into a little more detail about that? Like, what is uh, sure. what are the pieces? What is it? I mean, how are the heads? The heads have to be, you know, calf scan. How are, how's everything yeah, holding up? Skin, yeah, really well. So there's, um, you know, it has the, um, I think it's a 24 inch bass bass drum, uh, Lovelake um, Speedmaster. I think if I'm right. Um, 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 bass drum pedal and then he's got um like a 12 inch tom and a i think it's either a 13 or 14 inch i can't remember and then a and then a floor tom and um some really nice set of uh of wood blocks and cowbells and uh, he didn't he was known for his dislike of the uh of the hi-hat really and i think william f Ludwig had yeah had measured his foot i think for the for the uh, both for the the um, bass drum pedal and also for the early um, high boy, which uh, was this kind of condensed version of the of the hi hat, yeah, uh, and predated the hi hat. But he, but uh, Baby Dodds um, said he didn't didn't like that and rather be playing on the uh, the snare drum hmm. versus on the hi hat. Yeah, and that's that whole. Uh, I it's kind of cool how as I've gone through a lot of these histories, it's like where where the drummer keeps the time is what changes and kind of tells you about that, uh, that era. So if you're, if you're keeping the time on the snare, you're typically before a certain time, but then when the hi hat and the ride come in, but, um, so he's old school. Well, I mean, he's born in 1898 or whatever, as I'm, as I'm looking here, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, he is definitely, that's, you know, if whatever you're used to. So that's really cool. That's right. Yeah. And and it's also cool that he had that connection with the beginnings of those things, but you know, so. It's interesting because with a drum set like that, it makes you wonder if it was, uh, he's obviously connected with uh, William F. Ludwig the first and all that stuff. And if it's kind of a custom order drum kit and if it sounds like he would be like an early endorser sort of thing where it's, you know, you'd be That's right. very proud to have him on your, your roster. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know if this is an area of your expertise, but baby Dodds is one of those people where he is basically pre- kind of modern recordings and a lot of videos where you don't see him very much. Can you maybe give us That's right. a little bit of a background on who he is and uh, where he's from and what he did? Sure. Sure. So he, you know, he was, he wasn't from New Orleans. He was from Mississippi, but he ended up playing early as a, um, as a youngster in New Orleans, um, played with, um, with Louis Armstrong, I think for a little bit with King Oliver, you know, all the early greats. And, um, and really influenced early drumming um, pretty heavily, and mm-hmm. so um, um, you know he's on all the um, the high eights and all that early stuff with Louis Armstrong. Um, but uh, then later on, in the during the uh, revival of New Orleans jazz in the 
thirties and forties, people went back to him and said, you know, they wanted to record him and, and, um, and record, uh, um, you know, oral histories with him and, and film him performing, et cetera. So, um, Larry Garrow was one of those people. He ended up writing a really interesting book on, uh, on baby Dodds's life and recorded about 24 hours of, um, of interviews with him, including, um, um, demonstrations on, on that very kit that we have. And, wow. Yeah. And, uh, let, yeah, and Larry's still alive. He d- ended up donating those uh, recordings to us and we've since digitized those. Neat. We'll be making those available. Once, yeah. We, we have a, 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 a record label for the museum that's called Gallatin street records. And those will be available soon on, on, um, on that label. And, um, cool. Um, it'll be up online soon. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah. He's, um, I feel like Baby Dodds and Chick Webb both kind of fall in this um, category of being before like the Gene Krupas and those that kind of right. next and the Joe Jones, those next generation of like uh, people who could be filmed and could be shared that way. So um, so that's really neat. Um, cool. Yeah. What, what other what other stuff you got going on there? Let's see. We also have one of um, one of uh, James Black's uh, sets. Of course, that kind of fast forwards to the. 60s and 70s, James Black was an incredible New Orleans drummer, played with Yusef, T, Yusef Latif and Eddie Bowe and others, and um, from, you know, really uh, hardcore contemporary jazz from the time to uh, to um, super funky uh, New Orleans uh, New Orleans music with Eddie Bowe. He was, he was comfortable with all of that and traditional, traditional jazz and New Orleans jazz, et cetera. But, but we have one of his... Uh, one of his Remo kits. He was a Remo rep. And, yeah. uh, um, That's and, interesting. Um, we're fortunate to have that. Yeah, that came through Vernon Severin, who uh, is the father of Adonis Rose, the jazz drummer. Oh, wow. And, um, um, and Vernon, Vernon's father was a drummer. So there's a, there's a lot of drum history there. He, he uh, uh, James Black uh, taught uh, Vernon to play the drums as, as well, of course, as his father. But, um, Wow. So there's a real lineage there. So we have some a snare drum from Stanton Moore that he uh, that he um, has uh, provided to us, as well as a um, really cool one of the original uh, 1909 Ludwig bass drum pedals. This is the uh, the first mass produced bass drum pedal. Yeah. And so Stan Stan has loaned that to us for the exhibit. Um, cool. Let's see that drum from Shannon Powell, um, Herlin Riley, um, Joe Lasty. Um, list goes on and on. Oh, that's great. But there's some really cool stuff in there, in the, and also uh, a lot of photography too. Um, some great photographs by some of the leading uh, New Orleans photographers. Um, also, we have some drums that are loaned to us from the uh, Southern University um, African Art Collection, and uh, these are some some West African drums that are in the uh, Congo Square section. It's been fun uh, putting this exhibit together, and I should mention that uh, David Cuny is our uh, is our curator. He and uh, Bob Cadiolati, um did the majority of work on the exhibit and did a fantastic job. And um, um, so we're uh, lucky to have them with us, and uh, we've you know had contributions from Stanton and and uh, and many others. Now but, um, Stanton Moore is a great. Yeah. Uh, modern representation of that new Orleans sound and there's kind of a shuffle to it and it's that jazz, mm-hmm. but it's not, I feel like that kind of jazz doesn't take itself too serious. If that makes sense. Like it's right. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. And he's mixing it with, you know, other styles with funk and soul and other things. And, um, um, and you know, Stanton, uh, he just purchased, he and his uh, band purchased, uh, Tepatina's, uh, which is one of the, um, really uh cold nightclubs here in new orleans and um really keeps uh, the traditions going and so we're 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 excited that um he stepped in and is keeping the keeping the club moving forward stanton also does a a, a drum camp with us um every year and it's gonna this year it's in i think it starts around december 12th or so and so they'll have uh, folks in from around the country and he gives uh, a number of uh, individual lessons. He brings in people like John, Johnny Vodakovic and Shannon Powell to give individual lessons, and then he teaches the uh, teaches the camp. Cool. Well, I'm sure if anyone's around um, 
the New Orleans area and you're listening to this, then you'll uh, you'll obviously want to go and check all this stuff out. But um, why don't you talk a little bit more about the museum in general? Like, what do you guys do, and and what are like some special events and and all that all that kind of cool stuff? Sure. So we you know we um, we're a museum, and of course we do exhibits like Drumsville. Um, we do about eight exhibits a year. Um, we've recently opened a, a really fun exhibit on uh, on Louis Prima, and uh, that's an, uh, thanks in large part to the uh, Gio Manoni Prima Foundation. Uh, also, an exhibit of um, Eric Waters' photography, some incredible photography of Mardi Gras Indians and other cultural bears in, in New Orleans. Um, but we also do uh, performances, and so we have this incredible performance facility on our third floor. Uh, really, really a great sounding room. Uh, we have performances daily, um, Tuesday through through Friday at two o'clock. Then often concerts in the evening. And then we do about twenty festivals annually. Our our museum uh, takes about a, takes up an entire city block, and we have around seventy thousand square feet of grounds. And so uh, wow. we'll have multiple stages, one on either side of the building for the bigger festivals and. One that's coming up at Satchmo Fest um, on a on a good weekend with good weather. Um, I think the largest crowd we had was around fifty four thousand people, Jeez. and um, so it's a pretty big, pretty big festival. We that one, and then French Quarter Fest were a big part of that one, and Down River Fest, and another really great one is the Danny Barker Festival um, that takes place in January. But um, so we do a lot of that, and then also educational activities where we um, like, you know, Stanton Moore's camp falls within that, but we also do a lot of K through 12 programming and field trips. Uh, and we're about to open up a new education center. that will take up an entire wing of our first floor of the building. We'll have that activated in time for Satchmo Fest for them to have their, uh, have the uh, educational activities take place within there. Wow. So, Man, people are lucky to be, uh, to have that in their, in their city. That's for sure. Thank you. Thank you. We, we, uh, we love it. And we're, you know, our, our location, like I said before, we're between, um, we're in the French quarter, but we're like towards the edge of it on Esplanade Avenue, which is, uh, right between the French market and uh, Frenchman street where a lot of the loud music takes place in the, in the city. So jazz is very much alive and well, obviously in new Orleans. Um, cool. Well, Greg, um, Thank you so much for talking to me. And I'll tell people right now that they can go to NOLA, N-O-L-A, jazzmuseum.org. NOLA, jazzmuseum.org. And it is the New Orleans Jazz Museum. And the exhibit is called Drumsville. What was the full, the evolution of, I'll let you say that again. Yeah, sure. It's Drumsville, evolution of the New Orleans beat. And and also wanted to give a plug for some of our social. If you go to at uh, NOLA Jazz Museum, you'll find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Excellent. Cool. Well, everyone be sure to check that out. And if you're around New Orleans, then um, head to the New Orleans Jazz Museum. Greg, thanks so much for talking with me today, man. Thanks, Mark. Have a good one. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History, and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.